Hello and welcome back to the sixth episode of Workers and Resource Soviet Republic. Now, in this episode, as the title has said, people are finally arriving in Zhukovgrad, which is really fun and also terrifying. We'll get into a few political things and a few other uh, economic stuff. We've got a lot of things to go over. One thing I want to do is thank everyone who is subscribing, uh, and do subscribe if you haven't already, a uh, majority of the viewers are not subscribed, which is, you know, shame on you, but also it's a good thing. Uh, it means that more people are coming and seeing this these videos. That's great, YouTube's pushing the series. Awesome. I do want to thank you all for subscribing, because, I mean, I didn't even have 50 subscribers when I started this series, and I'm already approaching like 500. It's in it's crazy. If there is something interesting you want to see from this channel or this series at a thousand subscribers, I, I'm, I'm all ears. I, I do have a couple ideas. I don't want to just do a basic Q&A. That stuff's kind of boring uh, and kind of uh, like egoism and I'm not really into that sort of stuff. But if you do have questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. It's just, yeah, I don't want to feed that sort of egotistical, self-centered nature. The other, the, the, the idea I did have, though, was a live stream. Uh, if that's something that interests people here, I'd be willing to host a live stream on YouTube here. Let me know if you have any ideas or want something, uh, or want to see something. Though this, this will not affect the series, right? I'm going to try and keep it consistent. Anyways, that's enough rambling and waffling and whatnot. You know, like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. On to the video now. Alright, so, we're into the episode, finally. Now, this part here, we're just working on the train system. There was a depot built at the very end of last episode. And one thing I didn't really neglect, but one thing I do need to address is that trains from the depot only have a way to get towards the border. They don't have a way to get back towards Zhukovgrad and the rest of the Republic. Republic, the area, the region. Should just keep calling it region. So, the big, uh, the big loop here that we're doing is just a way for trains to turn around. And it's going to be used frequently. Just as a turnaround. It takes a bit to get this right. But I finally do manage to make it look really nice and circular. I'm sort of just doing stuff like this that is both required and necessary. I'm only deleting it here because for some reason the curve doesn't look right. Kind of does that wonky stuff. Sometimes stuff in the game does that. You just gotta find the right uh, angle and there it is. But yeah, with something like that, it'll allow trains from the depot to go in, out, and all around. But the more important part in our rail infrastructure is the signals. And signals are it's something that's a bit esoteric. There's a, I think there is a decent tutorial in the game for it. But one thing I found out, you can't do left-hand traffic with trains. You just can't. It won't work. The logic with trains, you just cannot do it. Now, how you do trains, it's very simple. There's a very simple, like, four to three, three or four rules. The fact that I can't remember how many there are is troubling. Oh, actually, no, yeah, there are four rules. Four rules. Rule number one, always right-hand traffic. You can't do left-hand traffic. Rule number two, um, the the double arrows, the mixed arrow, uh, the, the chain, right? What that means is, is it'll only go green, right? It'll only allow trains in if there's another signal from, in, in that intersection, in that junction, that's also green, right? What, what does that mean? That means you only want to put these double arrows, right? These chains. You want them at the entrance into a junction, right? So you only want them, for instance, the way I'm doing it, right-hand traffic pointing in towards the junction. And then you want a single arrow or just a normal signal pointing out, right? That's all you want. That's how you do all of your junctions. You do double arrow chain pointing into the intersection to go into one, and single arrows pointing out. That's, that is all you have to do. 
when it comes to stations and locations that are stops, or for instance a depot, you want what I've just done there, which is a mixed signal. You want a chain going, you want all of your chain signals pointing out. And then you want all of your single arrows pointing into the station. That means that trains will queue up to try and leave, and then if they have a way in, they'll just go straight in. But if there's people, if there's trains in that uh, in the area, in the station or whatnot, they will they will not attempt to go in. So make sure you put them after any sort of uh, switchover tracks or anything like that. Or if you are going to do it beforehand, like I'm doing here. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you should not be doing what I just did there. I'm gonna go fix those. That's that's why those um those colors are looking weird. Yeah. You know what? Sometimes it just takes a fresh mind to really see what's wrong. And again, that should be a change. Yep. And this intersection gave me a little pause, right? Because I had no idea why I fucked it up. Because it was clearly wrong. And and just to quickly clarify, blue means it's a segment of track, like a block. Orange means it's an intersection. Purple means the game has no idea what you're trying to do. And I've and I've done it the wrong way here, yeah? I've just realized, so... That should be a chain going the other way, please. The other way. Oh, man. Sometimes, yeah. Right, see, I've got, it, I've got it there. Okay. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That is actually correct. That's how you should be doing it. Although I think I should be putting more chains in there now that are... Yeah. Yeah, I've messed that up pretty bad. I'll have to go fix that next <laughs> next episode. I'm definitely fixing that. Um, so right now, one thing that hasn't been put down is an orphanage. And yes, a building just caught on fire in the background. I'm going to notice it later, I think. If not, it might get burned down. Now, the orphanage is... So you need you need to have an orphanage, right? Because sometimes uh, kids will just not have parents for some reason, right? And that's that's not like a game bug or anything. That's more like how sometimes parents die of old age, or many other reasons why a child may be without parents. So we have to facilitate that in our region. Also, one other thing before we jump to uh, another segment. Names for buildings, especially universities, hospitals, etc., even the stadium, football teams. I would really love your input for that. And also, if you have an idea for a character that may be introduced into the story, a politician, scientist, engineer, etc., put them in the comments too. Love to hear them and even incorporate them into the story of the series. But yeah, with that, this is uh, just going to be a couple of houses here built near the rail line. Dangerous, I know, but we will make appropriate safety barriers for those locations, fences and whatnot. Now, on to the next segment. This will be McQueen's top priority for the first five years of his time as General Secretary. The first priority that we need to get down, because we've got a lot to go through, I, I picked five comments, the top five comments, and tried to match them all in sort of priority. Like the, the, the best one, or sorry, not the best one, the one that was the most liked got the top priority, which was to significantly reduce the production of nuclear weaponry and focus nuclear power production. So at this point in history, we're talking 1961. This is prior to a lot of nuclear production. Currently, as of 1961, the Soviet Union has two operational nuclear power reactors. Obninsk and Belyarsk. Obninsk is a research facility and only produces 5 megawatts. Its designation as a search facility necessitates that it stays open as scientists from all around the Soviet Union will be working in this facility to produce some of the greatest nuclear innovations in the coming years. The Belyarsk nuclear power station, however, produces 108 megawatts, which is the most in the entire world and is another feat of Soviet engineering. It was built in 1958, and the Americans, desperately trying to catch up, tried to build the SL-1, which produced roughly 8 megawatts, and blew up just earlier in January. 
Currently nuclear power plants and their reactors are being built, operated and run by the Ministry of Medium Machine Building. With this first five year plan and the scale at which McQueen wishes to upgrade nuclear power capacity, an entire new ministry will be made out of parts of the Ministry of Medium Machine Building, the Ministry of Atomic Energy. In the real world, the Ministry of Atomic Energy was built and founded in 1989. So currently nuclear power production is very experimental, but uh, it is the future and it is quite the uh, opinion of both the engineers and the party that nuclear energy is the future of not only the Soviet Union, but electricity production in entirely. That'll be going on in the Soviet Union for sure. There are plenty of locations being scouted and one of which could potentially be Zhukov Grad itself. If McCoyan so wished, and the party also so wished, a nuclear power facility could be built in Zhukov Grad itself. It would cost nothing in terms of the materials being brought in, it would essentially be a free nuclear power plant. However, in order to offset this, we'll have to be constantly exporting electricity out of Zhukov Grad and the Ural Yug region for the foreseeable future. So, in essence, we'd be creating Ural Yug to be an energy exporting region. This is, we could reorganize this deal um, either way, mostly, and the idea would be is that we're going to be building a nuclear power plant in Zhukov Grad. Yes or no? That's, that's the big question. I'll put a link in the description for a poll on whether or not we should have a nuclear power plant in Zhukov Grad. I'll also put it on a pinned comment at the top of the comment section. So have a look there, put forward uh, your vote on that poll, and by next episode, I'll let everyone know how that's going to go. Just saying no doesn't mean we won't build it later as well. And with that, we'll move on to some architectural talk, where you'll also get to see me building a building. Yeah, building a building. Don't know if that works. Anyways, we'll be on to the next segment. Then we, be, then we will be back with some more comment stuff. So stay tuned. So this might be something different than what you were expecting. The game itself, Workers and Resources, has an editor which you can build buildings in. Now I'm not going to build a lot of building designs, I'll probably do it in the background, but essentially, this is the section I'll be going over building architecture and styles and how they evolved through the Soviet Union. I mentioned in a previous episode the presence of Stalinkas and Khrushchevkas. The main differences, and in fact, arguably, you could say Stalinkas had three, there, there are at least three different kinds of Stalinka. Like most places, the USSR had humans living in them, and humans tend to need somewhere to sleep at night. So shelters, or houses as these humans called them, would be built to house people. The USSR had two major periods up until now, 1961 that is, that dominated the types of architecture and styles of construction. St under Stalin, this was called uh, Stalinkas, the name of the houses that would, they'd be given. Stalinkas were n very, very good buildings, actually. Um, they had an extremely ornate exterior, um, often calling back to monarchistic uh, Roman sort of styles of architecture. They had a lot of effort put into them, and a lot of these buildings were literally designated to be art pieces alongside being houses. Now, these houses, due to the fact that they were artistically ornate and so intensely large, it required very, very uh, rigorous amounts of training for construction crews, uh, tower cranes, and large construction crews to complete. There were problems, of course. Uh, quality assurance was an issue, though um, this was not actually the biggest problem of the Stalinkas, it was just the cost. And the fact that they didn't actually solve uh, the amount of homelessness, or well, not homelessness, but uh, the lack of uh, secure housing for people. However, these houses are still to this day some of the best houses in the entire Russian Federation and in Ukraine and other um, parts of the Soviet Union. To this day, mind you. 
are still some of the best houses you can get. Under Khrushchev, a lot of the a lot a lot of people were still living in communal housing, um, still living in barracks, and while this number had been going down steadily under Stalin, and things have been getting better progressively under Stalin, Khrushchev wanted to address this problem, and concrete prefabricated panels was the big fad and the big style under Khrushchev. This is where most of those grim, ugly looking uh, prefabricated buildings uh, from the Soviet Union come from. They didn't actually look that bad. They were in comparison to Stalin because kind of ugly and they were in fact far lower in quality. The gaps between prefabricated panels often let air in making the houses often just cold or too hot, depending on the weather. Um, you could hear through apartment buildings, and a lot of the quality assurance on, on these sort of uh, buildings were not very good. The prefabricated panel technique wouldn't get perfected or even remotely um, improved to a, a substantial degree until Brezhnev, though by that point the era of stagnation was set, setting in. Now, how Makoyankas I envision being built would be a, a, re, a somewhat return to the ornate of Stalin, but with prefabricated panels as well. So some sort of mass producible, higher quality buildings. There needs to be a, a level of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of quality that can be assured to the people but also one that we can deliver to the people. Under Stalin, of course, uh, while there was a lot of quality, it would only go to people in the cities, the, the quality was undeniably some of the best ever built. McCoyan, um, Mc, under McCoyan, these, these housing projects are going to prioritize housing people in high quality housing first, before worrying about exceptionally high quality buildings. So what I've got here um, is essentially prefabricated building um, parts. Some of this had to be downloaded off the workshop as well. Now, the building plan of the Makoyankas are going to be a lot of the, 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 the big focus will be on sunlight, right? Um, getting a lot of uh, getting a lot of light, natural light. So almost building these buildings in a H sort of pattern with a common corridor going through the middle and apartments sort of branching off in like segments to make the little legs of the H. This means that you can have uh, a lot of, uh, you can have natural light coming in across the whole side where all the rooms and the living room will be and where the kitchen will be. And also these buildings will have several bedrooms. I believe the floor plan for each is a four bedroom apartment with a fairly spacious living room and bathroom it's quite high quality and also hopefully with some more perfected prefabricated panel technology as well these buildings should be uh, mass producible high quality for the masses the exterior and its appearance is important as well as we kind of want the people growing up in these buildings to be inspired by their homes by the way they live. If the Soviet people are not inspired in their lives, then they may feel dejected and they may feel like life is a, a bore or a chore. Not quite true, but there is a lot of studies in architecture on how poor architecture can negatively affect one's mood. So moving away from brutalist architecture is the way to go here. And second priority for his time in office. So for the second priority under McCoyan, we need to talk about the campaign uh, for innovation and setting up research centers, manufacturing centers to change their production into a more innovative and more technology focused production. The question is how can Zhukovgrad contribute to this? This trend will be working in the background and Kostogen will later be reporting on this. We could build a, an electronics manufacturing industry here in Zukovgrad as well. This might be something we build in line 
with the nuclear power plant as well. Though we might be splitting up resources there, it might take both of them a, a lot longer to do. We'll want to reverse engineer a lot of American and Western based computer engineering technologies. One of the newest technologies that have come out is a MOSFET transistor, M-O-S-F-E-T. So the 1960s, especially the mid 1960s, was a big boom in the computing age. MOSFETs are the pioneers of this age, though we don't know that yet. It's easy to think that a smaller transistor is always better, but it's actually more important that a transistor is faster, not smaller, though inherently a smaller transistor due to its smaller size will be faster as it requires less charge to charge them and less going out to discharge them. Only in the current time, we do not have the capacity for computers to computate simultaneous calculations, right? Currently, all computers right now are currently only single process computers, meaning one thing has to happen, stop, start the next thing, stop, do the next thing, stop, do the next thing, right? Technically, a modern computer can run infinite amounts of simultaneous tasks, right? You're probably questioning how that's possible. You need an infinite amount of CPU cores, okay? Or an infinite amount of threads or an infinitely fast computer. Those are the three ways that can happen. And I could get in, again, I could get into so much explanation about this. I could, I could do an hour long lecture on this and still need to talk about more. So I'm not going to here. So the option here for us, which I'll also put down in the community, in a community poll, and uh, I'll link it down in the description, is do we focus on uh, further gains years in the future, meaning we aren't going to see any, any of these benefits for maybe five to six years? Or do we work on our current technology and then look to just steal the US's technology innovations later? So yeah, go ahead and uh, vote on that one as well. And we'll come back with that. Anyways, on to the next section, which will be more of the YouTube comments and like uh, McCoyan's priorities. Gromko has news for us about Cuba. The declaration of a formal alliance between the USSR and Cuba has been a success. Cuba has accepted the declaration, and in any future conflicts, the two nations will be allies and will fight alongside one another. The US, in response, has not made any comments. This may be because Kennedy has only recently become the president and they are still formalizing a proper response to this. And once, uh, and from Gromko again, uh, going to Vietnam, direct aid has been sent to Vietnam. With our information on the flow of American arms, we have intel on roughly where they're going. And with the KGB's uh, expertise in this area, a lot of information on US military movements has caused the US to start losing ground in Vietnam for the first time in the war. The Viet Cong are now actively taking back portions of Vietnam. And just quickly, I would like to uh, show everyone here a good reason why this video has uh, been a bit later than usual. We now have a world map outlining exactly what's going on in the world in a quick glance. So, as you can see, we have a communist bloc, right? This is essentially the common turn of our day, which is all of the, uh, all of the nations that are allied with us in a military alliance following a communist uh, or at least we're in active conflicts assisting with. You'll see here in Vietnam and in Laos, since the Laotian Civil War and the Vietnam Civil War are both going at the same time, uh, and are pretty much the same conflict, though that's not actually true. Uh, you can see here that we are actually making ground uh, going further down south into Laos and in Vietnam. The uh, in, East, in Eastern Europe, of course, you can see the Eastern Bloc, uh, and you can see West Berlin as well. Um, Yugoslavia is in yellow as recently, uh, as recent as like if 10 years ago, if you call that recent, uh, Tito and Stalin had a split, uh, on ideology, material conditions, etc., etc. Uh, also warfare. Yugoslavia wanted to annex Albania. Uh, as you can see, we are guaranteeing Albania. So Yugoslavia is not going to be invading them anytime soon. Also, Yugoslavia has good relations with the West, despite their communist uh, ideology, and they have formed uh, a non-aligned pact. This is actually very recent, it only just happened. Uh, and all of these countries here in yellow 
are in the non-aligned pact. There are some other countries that are in the non-aligned pact, but their position has been is more or less closer to NATO. So they are identified as either a light blue, which is an ally of Western countries, and the dark blue is the NATO bloc. You'll also notice that there are some countries, uh, like Guyana, or uh, for instance, part of Yemen, or parts of, say, uh, like Mozambique, for instance, or Angola, they are for some reason NATO allies. You might be wondering why, if you're a history, uh, if you're a history nerd, you probably know that those are colonies. Uh, yes, there are still colonies in the 1960s. If uh, you didn't know, also Puerto Rico as well, and uh, Hawaii also colonies. Um, though people would argue Hawaii isn't a colony, it's a incorporated state, like OK Code. Uh, also, uh, all the way out here near Australia, you know, let's go Australia, huh? we're very evil. Um, there is a portion of uh, Portuguese colonies in the, uh, the West Papuan region. But um, yeah, this little part of uh, Indonesia is still a colony. Um, Myanmar is still a British colony. Yeah, um, Vietnam was a French colony. Uh, there are some unaligned nations. Uh, for instance, we're looking at places like Libya. We're looking at places like uh, Syria, um, Oman, Madagascar, you know, etc., etc. Even most of South America and even Central America is unaligned. Uh, Mexican, uh, the Mexican alliance with the U.S. hasn't really come about. Uh, the U.S. is more more worried about the Caribbeans right now. If you want a version of this map, like a, an actual like digital copy of this, you can go on the Discord and find a copy there. Uh, otherwise, uh, I might put it up on Reddit, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. I could explain this a bit more uh, if you want. I could zoom into more areas as well. Um, but this is the big overview of world relations right now. Back to more world news from Gromko. Our advisors moving between the Soviet Union and Vietnam have been intercepted in China. The, U the CIA has sent assassins to take out our advisors that have been proving crucial to the, uh, to the counterattack the Viet Cong has had on the US. This has brought China into direct conflict with the South Vietnamese and has brought China in to assist with the war as they believe that it is a declaration against their, uh, their country and their people. President Kennedy has used this situation to call out the USSR for using the inspection of goods into Vietnam as a means to track US soldiers in Vietnam and as a counterintelligence operation to feed the Viet Cong. This, of course, gets a round of applause from Western imperialist powers such as France, Germany, England, Spain, Portugal, etc. However, most countries and most onlookers are realizing that this is just a cover-up to hide the, the assassinations that have occurred. We, of course, obviously know that this is mostly a ploy. They didn't complain about this earlier and they're only starting to complain about it now because it's convenient. How do we respond to this is, is up to you guys in the comments. How are we going to deal with the US clearly subverting Chinese sovereignty? China has already proved and shown that they want to step up. This is in part thanks to our support and is probably a good opportunity for us to rekindle some good ties with the, uh, with the uh, Chinese. But also, in doing so, that means China is prone to being invaded through conventional warfare by the US. This might be a stepping stone to potentially nuclear warfare. We have to be very careful about this. So please have a have a good think about how we should approach this conundrum. And finally, the resistance movements in Syria and Lebanon. We've managed to move goods through Iran and Iraq, and also through Syria. We have, so far, as far as we understand, have remained completely undetected. Syria have have received our, our supplies, our weapons and, and arms, so has Lebanon. Both of these communist groups are working together in secret and using the trade network we've set up, quietly plan their revolutions in conjunction with each other. They planned to make this happen sometime later on in the year, possibly around December. 
The idea is that if both spring up at the same time, and if both or one succeeds, the potential of taking out the other and helping the other to succeed, limiting counter-revolution, uh, far more uh, likely. However, they do call upon the USSR to promise for Soviet troops to move in once the revolution succeed, and to help keep US counter-revolution and conventional invasion off the cards. Now we'll quickly move into a live play before getting on to the last parts of McCoyan's campaign. A lot of what you're going to be seeing in the background is just getting previously set up transportation logistics lines running. Stuff like goods to go to the bottling factory and goods to go into the warehouse and the shopping center in Zukovgrad. Because we are now introducing people into the city for the first time since the series started. I won't go into too much detail, it is very expensive, so if you do plan to do this in your own uh, game, make sure you have a lot of money saved up. You have to buy a lot of money from uh, outside the customs border, so keep that in mind. And we'll see as well, uh, our money does get really dangerously close to bankrupt. But don't worry, we have the uh, soda bottling plant currently working and giving us money, and that will more than happily keep us roughly equal as the production of the soda is able to give us enough money in exports to beat our imports. Though we are going to be in a precarious position, but McCoyan can help us out with the RCB and get us some more loans. June of 1961, Kennedy and McCoyan meet in Vienna. McCoyan does well not to reveal much of the USSR's plans, intimidating Kennedy with prospects the USSR has no signs of slowing down, but also assuring Kennedy that war is not on the cards for the Soviet Union. Instead, the USSR will show them that socialism is the future through their advancements. The meeting is cut short as Kennedy accidentally reveals that the US have intentions to invade Cuba within the year. This info goes straight back to the Soviet Union Castro directly, almost immediately after the meeting is closed. Provisional regiments and equipment move straight into Cuba as a response this seems to deter war in Cuba, pretty much effectively. With the meeting cut short, McCoyan returns back to the USSR, and Kennedy returns back to the US with his tail between his legs. Now for the bit of news going on about the Soviet Union. The Soviet space program is currently showing and ushering in great success as Yuri Gagarin returns from space alive and well, a massive achievement for the USSR's space program. The next big project for the Soviet space program is to build an international space station by 1964 with cooperation with NASA. The USSR space program also understands that it may just have to do it on its own, as NASA may be sanctioned from cooperating with the USSR space program. In other news, the economy looks to take a severe downfall in the short term, as a lot of managers are being recalled thanks to the new laws put in place by McCoyan and Kostogen. There is hope that this will end eventually after a couple of months, and that the economy should rebound. However, it will take a hit in the short term, and affect the Soviet Union in a negative way. The new quota system is having some issues early on as well. The implementation seems to be struggling, as many factories are not opting into the new quota system. Many wish to stay the course, and Kostogen believes they should be given the right to choose as such. Employment and working hours are actually looking far better despite this. The current trends suggest by the end of the year, the work week will be down to 41.7 hours on average, and managers are reporting more filled positions thanks to the new labor laws, despite all the chaos. And those are the managers that have either been fired, or the ones that have been hired in their positions. Very few managers have kept their jobs between the chaotic upheaval. Current predictions by Gosplan suggest our economy is going to fall by 2% this year, as the transition between economic laws has been very sudden and caused a massive dip in production across April and May. This will certainly recover, as June and July have shown a positive rebound beyond even January's figures. The quota system is being redrafted once again, though this is to address issues that Costigan and Gosplan did not foresee in the early and quick implementation of the new system. This new quota system will be prepared and ready for 1962. 
we will have to wait and see how that performs. And in further news, Khrushchev has gone on vacation in the US, however, is unaware that the KGB is spying on him. Also, the KGB know that the CIA is spying on him. The, the CIA also don't know that the KGB is spying on Khrushchev. They're completely unaware that our spy is a double agent, and is currently tailing Khrushchev as a CIA agent. The CIA believe they can recruit Khrushchev to the American side, believing that they can win him over on the emotions of revenge being ousted by the party. And finally, we will address the cybernetics field and attempting to reunite with Yugoslavia. Cybernetics is a rather new field, it needs to be re-established, as the debate has been going on for quite some time, with no end as to who and how it will be implemented. Each ministry wants to have control over the computer industry. We will need to catch up with the US, and currently most of our industry is in the Belarus SSR, which produces the Minsk-1, a mainframe computer that is far behind the US standards. They are currently also working on a successor and will likely enter production sometime next year. However, it's predicted to still be behind the US. The head researchers in the Belarus and SSR have urged us to seek ties with Yugoslavia and undo the split that occurred between Tito and Stalin. Yugoslavia has access to the Western markets in sparse amounts of the far higher quality computers that the US industries have been producing. The USSR, under Stalin, planned to invade Yugoslavia after attempting to assassinate and failing to assassinate Tito. And Tito, because of this and our recent policies, believes the USSR to be an enemy to Yugoslavia still. But we are able to have communications with him remotely, and Tito has assured the USSR if we're willing to expel and ban the Marxist Leninists in our party and publicly call for de-Stalinization once more, we could re-amend relations with Yugoslavia. He also calls for Khrushchev to take back the seat as General Secretary of the USSR. Without Yugoslavia, we will be on our own in terms of developing computer industry technology. I will leave this up to you guys in the comments whether or not we should be doing this. And yes, as you've probably gathered by all the uh, cinematics, this is the end of the video. I want to thank everyone for patiently waiting for this video to come out. This one was, again, a lot of work, um, but I also had a lot of personal things in real life. Nothing bad, of course, I've just got other personal uh, projects that I do in real life. And also have a job, etc, etc. But anyways, thank you for watching, um, and I'll catch you next time.